Uh, I'm Lanny Coffer. I was born December 11th, 1946 uh, in Hollywood, California, uh, but I grew up in the San Fernando Valley. Uh, I came from parents who both had a sense of social activism. Uh, my father uh, was a Holocaust refugee who escaped from Austria just before Hitler invaded uh, and uh, went on to uh, run for office in, in the San Fernando Valley to run for Congress and was the president of the Democratic Club. When Kennedy came to speak in Los Angeles in 1960, so I had that on my father's side, and my mother came from uh, a background of uh, her parents, my maternal grandparents, experienced a lot of uh, prejudice and anti-Semitism in Russia, and so she came out of that background. So they both instilled in me uh, a sense of uh, respect for all people, having been the victims of persecution and a uh, and, uh, sense of uh, standing up for my beliefs. Well, <clears throat> like most kids, uh, growing up until I reached a certain age was just growing up, being with my family and my friends. And then when I got into junior high school, started to become more aware, doing current events and seeing what was in the newspaper. And that's when I started to become aware uh, of the civil rights movement because that was some of the biggest news that was happening at that time. By the time I got to high school, uh, I was very much aware of it. The Freedom Rides uh, had just happened. Uh, I was doing current events about things going on in the South. And I did a uh, term paper on Gandhi. And that really opened my eyes to nonviolence. So uh, I say that because those are the kinds of things that made me a good candidate to uh, join the SCOPE project, having had that background already. I, uh, from, from my upbringing in the San Fernando Valley, I enrolled at UC Santa Barbara in the fall of 1964. And that's when the SCOPE project was announced. And uh, I saw a flyer that someone from the SCOPE project was coming to speak at our campus. So I went to hear this talk and I immediately realized that this is what I want to do. SCOPE is Summer Community Organization and Political Education. It was a, a voting a registration initiative designed to be implemented in the summer of 1965, assuming at the time that the Voting Rights Act would have been passed already, using that uh, legal apparatus uh, as support for the project. As it turned out, the Voting Rights Act didn't get passed until August, uh, and that's part of my story of what our summer was like there. So I heard this man speak. We started our own little uh, UCSB scope chapter, started raising money, raising awareness, getting a, a support team to, to be there supporting us when we went to the South and started planning our trip to orientation, which was in Atlanta in June of 65. Well, we drove out there, <clears throat> and uh, that was relatively uneventful, although I, I do remember as we got into the South and that we started to see the, the signs for the separate facilities, I, I knew why we were going there, and I, I had this odd fear that somehow the state troopers or someone would be able to smell that we were civil rights workers. <laughs> Nothing happened like that, but I already had a, a little sense of apprehension uh, about being in the position we were in. Well, the call went out, as far as I was aware, mainly to college students. And that's where I was, and the people that joined our project were college students. In my case, I went back and told my roommate someone who I had just met as a freshman, uh, but we were roommates, and I told him about it, and he decided to join too. So we drove out in his car uh, with a couple of other people from our local chapter out to Atlanta. And then at orientation, they added some other California students who weren't part of a group at their own campus uh, to our group to make it a little bit bigger group. And uh, orientation involved 
talks from people like Dr. King himself, other leaders uh, of the civil rights movement whose names didn't mean that much to me then, but now I know they you know, became icons of the civil rights movement. Well, I mean, I was a little in awe of him already at that point. This is, we're talking 1965. Uh, he'd already received the Nobel Peace Prize, so he was certainly someone I had a, a great deal of respect for. And I would say, uh, were the Scope Project not being sponsored by Dr. King, I don't know if, if I would have been as motivated to join. He was certainly a draw. I don't remember the specifics of that speech as much as the second time that I heard him speak, which was during the summer when we had already been assigned to our county, and he happened to be on a speaking tour and spoke at a college close enough to drive to, and I got to hear him then, and we were allowed to stand behind the scaffolding that was set up for him, and then he came down after his speech and met us and shook our hands. And, and thanked us for our work. So that was a, certainly a memorable experience. But I, what I do remember is the combination of his voice, the, the quality of his voice, which some people just have a gift of speaking that it doesn't matter what they're saying, you, you're, you can't help but listen. And that combined with the, the intelligence, the, the wisdom, the ability to craft the speeches that he gave uh, really uh, left an impression on me. Okay, well, orientation, we, we learned <clears throat> in general what to expect from the counties that we were going to visit, from the cultures that we were going to be staying with, to uh, understand about the churches and uh, the, just the, the, the community organization that was already in place, which was mainly around the churches, as well as what kinds of impediments we might run into in the registration process, but again, this was all generalized. So we got to our assignment, which was Sussex County, Virginia, and we found out there was a reason why we were assigned to that county, because of this one man. Uh, uh, can I say his name? <laughs> his name was Garland Gray. We got to Sussex County and we learned, as we drove through, this rural county that it was mostly pine forest and in between the pine forest were peanut fields and that was about all you saw other than a, a few small farms where you'd see some corn and other crops mostly peanut fields and pine forest and when we got to the main city our main town in the county Waverly Virginia we discovered that there was a man who lived in Waverly who owned all of the timber industry there from the logging to the sawmill he owned all the peanut business and almost all the african-american people worked for him and they lived most of them lived in his employee housing so he was their boss and their landlord and he was the president of the bank and the state senator from this county to the virginia assembly so I can't imagine any one person having much more power than that. And in the assembly, he was not just one of many assemblymen. He was the most famous and influential state senator because in 1955, when the, or 54, when the Supreme Court passed the Brown versus Board of Education decision outlawing segregation in the schools, Virginia launched something called, in quotes, the Massive Resistance. And Governor Byrd at that time appointed Garland Gray to head the commission to lead the resistance. It was called the Gray Commission. So that was 11 years before we had gotten there. So he already had a reputation as a, a fighter for segregation and against civil rights. So that was his hometown we were stationed in. So right away, uh, at first, there were these few really courageous people, from, mainly from the local church, because that was the network that Dr. King used. The SCLC is the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. So they worked through the churches to find invitations for the scope workers to go to these counties. And then that involved finding families willing to house us for a week or two at a time. Uh, aside from those few people who had volunteered to host us, 
the other adults at first did not want to be seen with us. Uh, but the kids had no fear. So we immediately had this group of kids from our age, you know, I was 18, down through the smallest kids, all, every minute from the moment we got there, from then on, there were always kids around with us. So they, we met, they were the first people we met, and right away we started teaching them the freedom songs and told them we wanted to have a mass meeting and could they get their parents to come to this meeting. So they immediately organized their own little march through the black side of town, and the town was very strictly segregated, one side of the tracks and the other side of the tracks. They had a little march, and um, we could see the people on their porches or looking out their windows, just checking this out. Then the kids went home and they told their parents, you've got to come to this, this meeting. And that's when we were able to introduce ourselves. Of course, it wasn't just us introducing ourselves. We had a field supervisor. Herbert Colton out of Petersburg, Virginia. So he was our liaison to the community and he gave us our directions from a, a master plan crafted by Dr. King and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Well, the main obstacle was uh, <clears throat> that the registrar was only open one day a month from nine to three on the first Monday of the month. That was it. Now. They had what they called the Good Old Boys Network, where if you were white, you could make an appointment and arrange to register, but the official hours were first Monday of the month from 9 to 3. So for a black person to get off work, especially if you worked for Mr. Gray, who was already the sitting state senator, that wasn't going to happen. You, you, there was no law that said your, your employer had to give you time off from work at that time. So, so uh, that accounted for low registration. So we, uh, we started using the steps of nonviolence, uh, which involves uh, negotiating with the, you know, whatever is the other side of the issue, the, the people that hold the power to affect the change you want to affect. And we exhausted all the options of meeting and letters and we, we actually, well, the SCLC, on behalf of us, uh, had a press conference and officially charged the Sussex County Registrar with voter discrimination based on the Civil Rights Act, which had passed in 64, and that, because the Voting Rights Act hadn't passed yet, which would have given more ammunition to that. Uh, but all our efforts through those channels did not lead to any change in the hours. So our next instructions were to organize a march. So we put this march together and we got over 100 people. A lot of them were kids, teenagers, but still we got over 100 people to come out and march about a mile through the pine forest out to the county courthouse, which is in the center of the county. And we had a rally there and uh, we thought we got a pretty good turnout. And we had a I won't say supportive newspaper, but we had an objective newspaper in Petersburg, which was the nearest larger town. So they reported on these events as they occurred, and I have the newspaper clippings from, from those papers that I'll add to the scope archives. Uh, the local paper right there in Sussex County was not very supportive, but the, the Progress Index did publish an article, showed a photo of our group gathered outside the courthouse and it was clear that there were a lot of people that wanted to be able to register but that still had no effect. So the next step in the strategy was to get as many people as we could down to the courthouse on that next Monday when he was open and see if we could get so many people that he couldn't get everyone registered within the six hours because then that would put the lie to his his uh, answer was always, this, nobody's coming in now, why would I have more hours? So we got over 150 people, adults, to come and register and they had to get in line to pay their poll tax. They were all crowded outside because there wasn't room in the courthouse for everybody. It was quite an event and it got great newspaper coverage with several photos. Still no change. 
So there wasn't much else we could do but continue regular demonstrations uh, at the courthouse around the, there was a Confederate statue right outside the courthouse, so that's where we did our, our picket, picketing uh, around the statue. And we continued to organize. We formed an uh, improvement association, which by the way is still there, 50 some years later, because part of our mission was a summer community organization and political education. That's the SCOPE acronym. So this was the community organization part was helping the people to establish something that would still be in place after we left. So we were doing that. Um, we did have uh, some incidents that happened during that time as we were continuing to build our coalition, build the interest in voting so that once the hours hopefully were open, were expanded, people would be able to register. One thing that happened was a couple of our, our workers who were white went to lunch at a local diner with these usual group of kids we were hanging out with who were black. And uh, they sat down and nobody would take their order. They just sat and sat. And they finally got the waitress to bring out the owner from the kitchen. Uh, and she told them that she couldn't serve them because they were closing. But they obviously weren't closing. Uh, and that was the only explanation she would give them. So they left uh, because our mission was not to integrate the local restaurants. Our mission was to register people to vote. So we, <clears throat> they left. She actually did close her restaurant for good. The next day she went out of business and put a big like four by eight plywood sign out in front of her business that said closed on account of niggers. And that was in the newspaper. I have the newspaper clipping with a picture of her standing by her, her sign at her restaurant. So that was one incident that didn't result in any, any injuries or anything. Uh, and I'm telling you these incidents because these are things that were happening during the summer leading up to the conclusion of our struggle with the registrar. So another incident, oh, should I go on with yes. these? Another incident uh, that I participated in was um, my, my roommate, Phil McKenna, and I had been staying with the same families uh, as we, you know, a week or two at a time. And after a couple of weeks, we had to do our laundry. And the laundromat was in the white part of town. So we took our laundry and our usual group of new friends with us, and we went to the laundromat, put our clothes in the machines, and sat down to wait for our clothes to wash. And someone notified the owner that we were there. So he burst in the door in a rage, just screaming. He bolted the doors so that we couldn't get out and literally held us prisoner in his laundromat so that he could berate us. Uh, he, all the time that he was yelling at us uh, with lots of profanity, he took our clothes out of the machines and threw them on the floor and poured Lysol in the machines to purify his machines so that his white customers could use them after we used them. And he came up to each of us and grabbed us by the shirt collar and cocked his fist back like he was about to punch us in the face, which he didn't, fortunately. And we got to practice our, our calm, nonviolent communication and just reminding him that by holding us prisoner, he was in effect kidnapping us, and that was a felony. And he could go to prison for a long time, so if he would just let us take our clothes and leave, we would not press charges. And he did finally relent and let us go. But there was a more serious incident. Two of our workers went to one of the many meetings we attended at local churches throughout the week and on Sundays, but this was a midweek, late night, returned from a meeting out way out in the pine forest on a country road and they were driving back to town and a truck pulled up behind them and tried to ram into the back of their car and push them off the road. So they started going faster. Then the guys in the truck stuck uh, either a rifle or a shotgun out the window. So then they just hit, hit the gas at you know, full bore and they made it back to town 
And as soon as they pulled into the street lights of town, they recognized the truck and the guys in the truck. So armed with that information, we had a meeting with our, our supervisor who contacted uh, headquarters of SCLC and decided that we should press charges. So I don't remember exactly what the charges were, but I think they were something to do with endangerment and brandishing a firearm, things like that. So we had this trial, such as it was. Uh, the judge was a very old man. Uh, his questioning showed that he was very prejudiced against us and didn't think that we should be there, didn't think that white people should be associated with black people. And uh, the interesting thing was that the, uh, our story was not oh, our story. The story of our workers who were pressing these charges was not disputed. The guys who were in the truck were in the court. They admitted that they were in the truck. The workers were able to describe the truck that they were in. But when the judge asked them to state for the court record the exact year, make, and model of the truck, they were not able to do that and he threw out the whole case for lack of evidence. And I have to tell you, when I walked out of that courtroom, I felt, again, that apprehension. I felt like they were coming up with some kind of charges that they were gonna charge us with before we got out of the courthouse. I didn't know what it was gonna be, and they didn't. But again, that feeling like I was just glad to, to get out of there without something worse happening. Uh, well, there were two. Uh, before I answer that, let me just finish the, the story of the registration, because finally in August, the Voter, Voting Rights Act was passed. So we went, we drove to D.C. because we weren't that far away, we were in Southern Virginia. Uh, we drove to D.C., we went to the Justice Department, to the Attorney General's office. We explained the situation. They contacted the county and told them they would send federal registrars in to take over voter registration if they didn't expand the hours. And that is what got the job done. So then we were able to actually do what we were sent there to do, which was register people to vote. Uh, what I got from it is two things. First, from being able to, to uh, be part of the implementation of the voting rights initiative, of Dr. King and the SCLC and Hosea Williams, our, 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 the director of SCOPE, um, I was able to experience the power of the vote, the power of community organization, of political education, because I went back to that county 20 years later, and by that point, 20, in that 20 year time, they had blacks on the town councils, in these towns, they had blacks on the county board of supervisors, on the police department. There was a woman who was one of our hosts while we were there who had become a magistrate in the court system. So there was clear and visible proof that voting makes a difference and that our project helped that, that voting. So that was one, one thing I got from it. The other part, that's what I feel like I was able to to give to the project, but what I got back from it was a sense of community that I had not experienced in my own neighborhood in the San Fernando Valley, which was really, I realized once I was in this town, was so impersonal. I didn't, I, I knew the names of most of the people on my street, but some of them I didn't even know their, their last names. I'd only been inside the homes of of two of the people on the whole block that I lived on. There was just not that, that sense of, of, of neighborliness and knowing your neighbors. And in, in Waverly, there was so much love and everybody knew everybody and people went in and out of each other's homes and, and we were just taken in with such generosity and such love from people who you know, had so little materially to offer, but they always fed us the best you know, food that they had. And so I, I came back really feeling a little bit alienated from my own culture and missing that kind of camaraderie and that, that sense of community that I had experienced there. So that's what I got from, from living in that community. Well, I think we have certainly have made progress. Uh, and I could see it right here in, in South Carolina. 
just, uh, you know, the other night we went to that band playing in the park and it was a, a black band playing black music and the audience was mostly white and everybody was having a great time. You wouldn't have seen that in, in Virginia, you know, in 1965 when I was there. That's just one example, but I know there are many examples of elected officials and <clears throat> voter registration uh, statistics that show that <clears throat> there has been progress. Uh, at the same time, obviously, anyone who follows the news knows that racism is still uh, rampant in this country. And uh, it's going to take more than just the vote to change that. Because you can change laws, but that doesn't necessarily change people's hearts. And, and that's where the other aspect of this work comes in. That's the nonviolence part of it. There was the, the voter registration, community organizing, but the methodology was nonviolence. And nonviolence speaks to a person's heart and soul, where the other political side speaks to their minds. And that's where I hope that we, as Scope 50, can be part of continuing that nonviolence education uh, because it leads to people looking at themselves in a, in a deeper way and their relationships to other people. And I think if more people had that kind of training, then we wouldn't have some of the violent confrontations and some of the conflicts that we're having. Well, this is their world that, that they're going to be living in. Uh, I'll be gone in a few years, but they'll still be they have the opportunity now to make the world they want to live in. You know, this is their future. And, uh, and so I, I try to share as I go around to schools that my story is one example of the power of voting and hope that it inspires them to see how they can connect that to the issues they care about and how they can affect change in those issues through getting people to vote.